So my name is Christopher Bennett. I'm the owner and founder of Intervention and Recovery Institute based out of San Diego, California. Um, I'm a KDAC to a nationally certified intervention professional as well as a board registered interventionist. And some of you might be sitting here thinking, why the hell is a KDAC 2 going to be talking about schizophrenia and intervention? Um, that leads into my background. I, I began working in the field in 2008 at a treatment center that specializes in primary mental health and co-occurring disorders in San Diego. So the majority of the clients I worked with as a part of their clinical team were schizophrenics who had active addictions. Um, so I had th three years of 50 to 55 hours a week of pure involvement with schizophrenia. And I was really blessed about three months into working there to get the opportunity to begin training and mentoring under my mentor, who's fortunately in the, in the room today, which is pretty awesome, uh, Jeff Klein. And he brought me in and showed me how they had really developed a model of intervention that was successful in intervening on active psychosis, schizophrenia, um, all type of mental health disorders. And they were watching these, these individuals who had been in treatment been in hospitals, institutions, on and off their whole lives. People had thrown them away and told them they could never get better. And these guys were getting these young people into treatment and they were getting better. And they were working and getting jobs. And so I have an amazing respect for the work that's been done to this point, uh, as well as for the process that was developed. And I feel extremely blessed and lucky to um, be able to continue to do this work. So really, it's interesting, let's see if this will work. Jeff will know this picture. Um, this was actually one of the first interventions I ever did. This is the reality of mental health intervention. Um, can you guys tell in the audience what this is? Anybody who hasn't seen this before? That's a person, that's a picture from my camera phone reaching over about a three foot bush in downtown San Diego. Do you see what's around them? It's trash. This is a severe case of OCD and hoarding. This young man took 13 hours to get him in treatment during an intervention where the cops kicked the door in, threatened suicide. He ended up absconding from treatment and we were able to work with the local community in downtown San Diego, posing as drug addicts slash police officers. Um, and we were able to locate this young man and get him back into treatment. And the reason I always use this with presentations, especially with mental health, is because this is the reality. You know, I don't think that, you know, we've done interventions in restaurants, street corners, a ditch, on, um, you know, anywhere where it is. And this is, especially with active psychosis, we really don't get a lot of opportunities just to walk into somebody's house and have an invitational intervention and ask them if they would like to be a part of this really wonderful family process that we're about to engage in. You know, so I love this picture because this is his feet right here and he's sleeping in a pile of trash. So we're, we're, I just want to go over a little bit of kind of the background of even what we're dealing with. And again, you saw my qualifications. I'm not going to stand here and talk about treating schizophrenia. It's not what I do, you know, but I do know how to get individuals and family systems healthy and get someone into the necessary hands of people like yourselves who are able to treat these people. So obviously the thought disorder component of schizophrenia. So, you know, who in here has worked with schizophrenia in a clinical component? So what do you guys see with the thought disorder? Okay, so delusional thinking, <coughs> out of touch with reality, really disorganized thinking, right? One sentence is here, one sentence is here, it's all over the place. You know, second component, really, the hallucinations and delusions, whether they're auditory, visual, plus the, the delusional component. You know, a lot of the schizophrenics, that I had the absolute pleasure of watching heal and grow, um, came in and thought they were famous. But we were the only people at the treatment center who didn't know they were famous. Um, that they were in the Truman Show. That there were cameras everywhere, and they were on TV, and they were extremely famous. And So that's what we see with the delusional component of this. And then really third is sometimes we get the movement disorder with it where, you know, I worked with a client for actually the entire time, the entire three years I worked in treatment who had a catatonia. And it was really based in her ultimate fear that was happening within her. And she would literally stop walking in the middle of a grocery store with one leg up and stop. And she'd stand there for minutes at a time, you know, and being able to create that safety for her to allow her to come out of that is really important. But again, I mean, very generally, that's what we're dealing with, with schizophrenia. 
Now, I love talking about the family systems around this because I think so many times we look at you know, addiction and what addiction does to family systems and how they operate and all these different things. The families that I've worked with who have schizophrenic loved ones are far, far more maladaptive. I, and I, I see the smiles <laughs> because you guys have the experience. And really what we see are these generational patterns that are passed down from mother to, mother to daughter to next daughter and everything else going down. So in terms of these patterns, anybody who's worked with families like this, what do you see? Rates of schizophrenia, mm -hmm. <laughs> or schizophrenia type or cluster A type symptoms. <laughs> but I mean, a lot of what we see is the genetic component of schizophrenia as well. So we always do a lot of family mapping genograms to really illustrate to families that this is not something that just happened. It didn't just occur. And most of the times, families can identify an uncle, a cousin, a father, a mother, somebody in the family who's had schizophrenia before. When we look at how the generation above treated that individual who was suffering from this illness, it's just carried right on. So we see mothers acting exactly like their mothers who are acting exactly like their mothers all the way down. The cultural component. I put this in here because it's really interesting. I've worked with African American families, Caucasian families, Asian families. What are some of the cultural components you think are important with these family systems going into an intervention process? Shame. Yeah, I actually I actually had the absolute pleasure of speaking to a mother kind of in a informal setting during an intervention process during a break and I said, you know, she was from Vietnam, she had married a Caucasian man. So we were talking about that I felt it was really interesting that she was the one who actually initiated reaching out and looking for help. And we I wanted to kind of get a sense, a personal sense of what that was like for her to have reached outside of the family and ask for help. And she said, I've told everyone in the Caucasian side of the family what's been going on with my son. I haven't told one person in the Vietnamese side of my family what's going on with my son. Right, so we see these families that are split apart. Um, and there's just different components. Also in that, um, her sister, the aunt of this young man we were doing an intervention on, said that in Vietnam, most of the times they don't even believe in mental illness. <laughs> They believe it's an emotional problem. So even when I'm standing there and I have the documentation in hand from the behavioral unit with the diagnosis, with the symptoms, and we're literally illustrating this, they're still saying, I just have trouble understanding this because that we don't believe in that culturally. I had a gentleman in a class of mine who was from Cameroon, and their way of dealing with mental health issues or addiction is they literally tie the people up to their beds. They don't let them leave the house because they don't want the community to know. So the chain of... So coming here, it was um, quite a culture shock. Right. And then we're going to get to that point about crippling emotions. You know, so many times these families are just suffering by such intense shame, guilt, fear, anxiety, worry. And really, a lot of people take on that somehow the schizophrenia or the mental health disorder or the addiction is their fault. Mm -hmm. Or they tell themselves that somehow if we would have done something different, it wouldn't be this way today. You know, so there's just this really, there's this piece of emotions which leads right into learned helplessness. Most of these families who have, we've done interventions on, have been trying at this for years and years and years. And they just are helpless. And they'll tell you, I feel completely helpless to do anything right now. Because what happens with somebody who gets actively psychotic or has a break? They get hospitalized, they get some medication, and then they discharge and they say, help your son, daughter, brother, sister take his meds, and there you go. And that's happened repeatedly, repeatedly, and it just continues. Um, and so families really become just completely helpless. They don't even know what to do. Which again, a lot of these lead right into each other, but then it's the codependency factor. So the learned helplessness of I can't help my kid, I don't no clue what to do here, leads into this idea of, well, now I have to take care of everything. I have to give him money, I have to give him food, I have to give them whatever they want, whenever they want it, to make sure status quo stays the same. Make sure the homeostasis of this family stays the same. Because if it gets disrupted, it gets really bad. 
And then this is an interesting concept for me. And the reason that I talk about clients with schizophrenia having being perceived as fragile. Again, I've watched clients who have been institutionalized for three years in states where you can actually institutionalize somebody for years at a time. I've watched them come out. I've watched their families change. I've watched them get the help that they need over a period of time. And I've then seen those men and women drive up in their car and talk to me about the job they have and the apartment they have. So for me, a lot of what we try to do with this, and we're going to talk about it as we, as we move forward, is how, is how do we allow families to get to a point where they realize that just because their loved one has a mental health disorder does not mean that they're not capable of being successful in life. They may just need a little bit more support, and they may need long-term support. But I think so many families think, oh my God, it, what happens if my kid walks out of treatment? And, and what we do a lot, especially, is we separate illness from behavior. And it's a really important thing for families to realize what is behavior and what is the illness of schizophrenia that's going on. And we always joke that we have families who ask, you know, why does, uh, why does my son get angry and punch my husband in the face? And we say, well, what was the situation going on? Well, my husband told him he wouldn't give him $20 and he wouldn't give him the car keys. Behavior or illness? Behavior. Behavior, right? Why, did, why does he break my windows? Because you let him, right? We, and we always say, what happens when the police show up? Oh, he gets totally good. He doesn't talk that way anymore. He, he straightens up. He doesn't talk about being violent anymore. He doesn't do any of that. So it's like the families have effectively been taken out of the parental role and put into the child role. So now we perceive these people as fragile, and that a lot of we use a lot of metaphors when we work with these families because it's such it's such in depth work, but we really have to get them to a place where they're ready to do something different pretty quickly. So how do you guys think families interact like this with schizophrenia, with someone running around psychotic, disorganized thinking, saying all kinds of weird things, and getting violent here and there? Like, I don't think they interact very well, to say the least. I think everyone walks on eggshells because they don't want to say something, they don't want to be somewhere, they don't want to aggravate or anger or anything like that. And then what, is, what does the client react to in this family? Words, behavior, tone of voice, what do you think somebody with schizophrenia is going to be picking up on throughout all this just interaction in home life? Stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Right. Very intuitive perceptions. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things that we talk about is the idea of containment. And how somebody who's suffering with schizophrenia really needs containment to feel contained, to feel safe when they don't feel that within their own family, their own system at home, you're exactly right. The anxiety is what really provokes a lot of this behavior. So again, how this model of intervention was developed, and I've decided to call it a system. I don't like the word model. I think models are very set in stone. I think they're very cookie cutter, and I think they're step-by-step -step instructions. I've never, in my life, since I've been doing interventions these last four years, have walked into an intervention and been able to follow a set of rules. Been able to follow my exact plan that I planned out before I went in. I like the word system a lot more because it changes. It molds, it grows, it innovates, it does all these different things in the moment. Because again, picture somebody walking into your room who's six foot two, 240 pounds, actively psychotic with a long-standing history of violence. How in the world are you supposed to know exactly what's going to happen when that person walks into a room? So, I like the word system, and this was more, like, I put words to this. Um, Jeff actually wasn't the one who put his own name on it, but I decided to. <laughs> so, really, the reason this was developed was clinical necessity. What happened is these people were calling Humble Cheetah in San Diego and saying, I have a schizophrenic son who needs help, who's been hospitalized 15 times in the last five years. And, and, and we were saying, 
well, can you get him through the door? And they would say, no. If we ask him to do anything, he'll, he'll scream at us, he'll yell, he'll, we're so afraid. So this was an opportunity where the clinical team, really the, the, the clinical directors and Jeff were able to come together and say, well, we have to be able to do something that's going to be able to help these families. It just doesn't make sense that we can do this with drug addicts, but we can't do it with somebody suffering from a mental health disorder. And so really it was based off of the clinical necessity of them just watching how many people weren't able to get the help that they needed. Whereas if somebody calls and says, I have a heroin addiction, there's 5,000 interventionists around the country who will go out that day and do something about it, right? And then, you know, struggling families. I mean, if you've ever talked to a mother or a father or a brother or a sister who has a, who has a loved one who has schizophrenia that's been untreated, these families need someone to come in and be able to uplift them, provide a little hope, empowerment, that something can be done about this. And I think it's a lot of what happens in the system is just the repeated hospitalizations, the repeated this, the repeated that, and nothing ever gets better. So again, repeated hospitalizations, you know, it's like we're not, we weren't fostering, or at least years ago it wasn't, we were fostering people getting 72 hours on a 5150 and then right into a long-term continuum care program. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, obviously, primary mental health care costs money. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, a lot of families don't have just an exuberant amount of money for years and years of care. Um, but again, and then lack of appropriate treatment. Um, you know, Sovereign Health, I, I, I brought them a client. But that, the reason this presentation even came about was I brought them a schizophrenic client post-intervention right before Christmas. And I remember during the admission process, my, my contact said, you did an intervention on this, on this guy? He's a young kid, 19 years old, schizophrenic, you did an intervention? I said, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? This is what we do. I said, this is really what we specialize in, is primary mental health intervention. Um, you know, and really the, the lack of appropriate treatment for true primary mental health care outside of a hospital-based setting. There's a lot of places where you can hospitalize someone for a long, long time in the right state with the right stuff, and you can get conservatorships and everything else. But realistically, is that what's really going to help the problem? In some cases, don't get me wrong, in some cases you do need that structured level of care. But somewhere like Sovereign, PCH, Hamblichia, um, Cooper Reese, like all these places allow to foster independence and healing without feeling like I'm being hospitalized for the 55th time. And really just the, just the, the destructive stagnation of these families where it was, it, it, and it leads into all what we've been talking about, just the learned helplessness, the codependency, just the, the homeostasis in this family stays the exact same because they are so afraid to disrupt the pattern of what's been going on for fear of what they've experienced up to this point. And so again, this, would, this is a tough sell a lot of times, because families don't understand. Like, yes, I understand your son's fine, I understand he doesn't want to go to treatment, I understand that he's been to 50 treatment centers. Mm -hmm. But we can still offer this, you guys and your son, daughter, brother, sister, the needed support. And then again, lack of professional sport, uh, support, training, and implementation. Again, I, I know a few people around the country who will do primary mental health intervention. But be before today, who would you guys have called in a situation where you had someone actively psychotic, diagnosed schizophrenic, violent past? Who would you guys pick up the phone and call? You. Well, <laughs> so hospital or the police. Right, so then we get the perk team out. Her team assesses. They say, yep, he's danger to himself, danger to others, or he's gravely disabled. We get him in on a 5150. But the problem typically, though, like you are saying before, with the her team, especially if they've had a lot of repeated hospitalizations, the pet team comes, the police show, they are just well behaved. I'm not going to hurt anybody. I definitely don't want to kill myself. I love my... Mm -hmm. You know, and we've even had those moments, even in treatment, when they get really violent right. or really inappropriate in treatment. You even whisper the word that they're, you're going to call the person or take them to the hospital. <clears throat> they are just ship shape up and they just <laughs> play nice. <laughs> so, like you said, you know, it's really, really difficult, especially with the patients that know how that have been through repeat hospitalizations or institutionalized. Mm -hmm. They know how to shape up. Right. 
And so again, I, I was I was telling some friends before this. I was like, you know, it, 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 it's so it's been so difficult for me to try and narrow this presentation down into 50, 50 or fifty five mm -hmm. minutes because realistically, I could take forty hours and talk about what we do in this. Yeah. And talking and utilizing the authorities is an extremely important piece of what we do. And how to talk to police, how to talk to the PERT team. These are all skills that you really do need when you're working in that situation. But so I imagine agree. how hard it is for the, I mean, the families. I mean, we're talking about trained professionals that know how to do this. But I mean, you're talking about family members. Mm -hmm. Like who, I mean, how helpless and hard it is for those family members. Mm -hmm. So they do, they're such a need for families. So that's like when I ask, you know, it's like Patrick knows me. Like all these, like some people in here know me and they say, we call you. But like if you didn't know me, you're not going to, like you, there's not a lot of available resources. Now I do know a few, again, like I said, that do specialize in this line of work. Um, but there's just not a lot of awareness. And that's a lot of why I wanted to talk about this, was to basically just bring awareness that there's help out there for these, for these people and their families. So that was really how this was developed. It was really just out of a pure necessity and people coming together who are incredibly intelligent, incredibly innovative, and saying, you know what, like we're going to do this. And people are still in treatment that we've done interventions on. The retention rate is good. We're not seeing the repeated hospitalizations. And we're seeing families change. And I think that's the most important thing. And I'm going to share, I'm going to share an example of one of the worst case scenarios that happened in here in a minute, but like overall, like our work is systemic is systemically based. I mean, it has to be because the families are so maladaptive by the time they get to us that if we just think by all means necessary, gangbusters down the door and get this guy into treatment, it's not going to be effective. I've watched more mothers and fathers decom quicker than their loved ones when their loved ones have been in treatment. When they've been getting the help that they need, I have watched mothers and fathers fall apart in front of my face and just think, Fam if, if this is family. If the family heals, if the system heals and grows, everybody in the system gets better. So it's like with the family, we focus a lot on education. Even though there's been repeated treatments most of the time, repeated um, you know, appointments or whatever it is, they haven't been a lot of times educated on not only the illness, but also the available resources. So a lot of times with families, like NAMI has a 12-week free program for families. You know, uh, what does treatment for schizophrenia look like? I think so many times we have this stigma around mental illness that it's like we think treatment for it looks like Shutter Island, right? <laughs> 1800s look at hospital, and, and you know, go, you're going to go in there and you're going to get meds and you're going to be on the Thorazine shuffle, and that's your life. You know, so education on treatment is so important. And I think one of the biggest ones for us is we create safety plans for these families. And we offer them a way out. And what we say is when this happens, you do this. And we collaborate and we work with the family to really create safety. Because again, what we're talking about is families who haven't felt safe enough to walk to their fridge and to say good morning to their loved one for fear of what might happen. Or not to give them the car keys. And so what we have to really do, we create safety plans for these families. What are they going to do if this happens again? What are we going to do if so-and-so needs treatment, walks out of treatment? How are you guys going to take care of yourselves and stay safe? Especially, and again, I want to, let me back up for a second. Not everyone with schizophrenia is violent. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important distinction to make here. You know, I use those examples because those are the examples that usually come through our door because the families are just so afraid. And they've been, they've been in jail, they've been here, they've been there. And, and a lot of the cases we've worked with, we've been premised with, this person is violent and has a history of violence. But by no means necessary does every, everyone who has schizophrenia violence. Just not true. Um, and then we really empower and create hope within these families. And I think, again, a metaphor that we use all the time is kind of taking back the executive role in your family. You're the parent, they're the child, they're obviously very sick, and we need to empower you to be able to get them the help that they need, and be able to continue following through. And I always talk about things like this being can like cancerous, diabetes, heart disease. Like these are treatable illnesses, yet they're chronic, they're progressive, they get worse when they're not treated. And I ask families, you know, what would we do right now if you came and said that your loved one had 
cancer. You'd say, I'd throw him in the car, I'd be taking him to the doctor, I'd be you know, sitting by his side through the chemo, I'd be making sure if they told me to go to support groups, that I'd be going to support groups. And then we say, well, why can't we just do that with your son's illness now? Well, we're too scared, what if he does this? The what ifs are deadly with schizophrenia in particular. And then really we, we work to shift the homeostasis in this family. And when I talk about homeostasis, I use simple, simple metaphors with families that I work with. We talk about like mobiles over baby's beds and stuff, because most of the time it's, it's, a, it's a son, a daughter that we're working with. And we say, what happens if you like pull one of the balls off of the mobile over your baby's crib? And they say, oh, it starts to spin all whack and, and everything like that. And I say, well, really, like, that's what we have to do right now. We have to really shift what's been going on, because the, even though it hasn't felt very good, it still feels comfortable, even in its uncomfortableness right now. So a lot of what we do, we look at family interaction. How, like we talked a little earlier, how is this family interacting? Not well. <laughs> not well. <laughs> Communication patterns are done. People do, are not talking about thoughts. They're not talking about feelings. Most times we see people internalize everything that's been going on. We watch husbands and wives who either might not be sleeping in the same bed, might not be sleeping in the same house. And, what, and usually what we see is, in terms of the behavioral patterns, that there's usually one who is so helpless yet codependent, and the other one cannot stand it. So when we look at the dynamics of families, we see sisters, brothers, and other loved ones who are saying, stop giving them money, stop doing this. So relationships within these whole families are so strained and it's even outside of addiction, because again with addiction, you can sit there and you can say, this is the drugs. He's a heroin addict, he's an alcoholic, this is why he does this. With mental illness though, so much, there's so much denial that goes into this. Families do not want to believe that their loved one is sick. And especially with something like schizophrenia. Because what type of stigma is out there if you are schizophrenic? Imagine the stigma we have for addiction. Imagine telling someone that your loved one sees things, hears things, does really strange things in public, can't go out. You know, there's a lot of stigma around this. So what we do is we really work on strengthening relationships. It's a lot of solution-focused work. We try to say, stop. <laughs> Has anyone in here seen the, 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 the therapist who tells you to stop? The old, the old, uh, you got it. You know, I'm feeling anxious, stop it. <laughs> right. So I, I say these things obviously knowing that this is not what we tell them, but, but realistically our goal would be to stop thinking and start doing. And engaging them in solution-oriented work. Because the thinking is what gets you in trouble. It's not the behavior. So when we're at NAMI, when we're at al when we're in therapy, when we're meeting with, with the intervention team, when we're, when we're meeting with the family therapist at the treatment center, like that's good stuff. It's when you sit around and think of the what ifs. So what we do is we strengthen the relationships. So if mom and dad haven't been communicating, that's the first line of communication that we want to establish here. When we tell mom, before you give him money, you call me first. If you can't get a hold of me, you talk to your husband immediately. If those two don't work, we're gonna continue down. We set these families up for success, we have to. Because it's like, we can't just walk into a room and within 20 hours, change a family. I really wish I was that good. I really do. But it's not possible. You know what I mean? So even if we have 30 hours with this family beforehand, which is a lot usually, we can get them to a good place, but if they don't know what their triggers are, if they don't know how to strengthen a relationship, if they don't have solution to take care of themselves physically, spiritually, and emotionally, this family will decomp guaranteed. So we have to be able to provide them with solution to what's been going on. And I don't want them writing a journal. You know what I mean? I want them doing action, action, out. I asked, I asked this last mother, the, the client that I brought here before, and I said, when, what, what do you love to do? And she looked at me, she said, I love to dance. I never had anybody tell me that before. And I said, when's the last time you went dancing? And she said, I don't know. And that's what we see is these people have skills. Families are inherently resilient and have strength. What we have to do is be able to help them facilitate bringing that back out. 
And then in this process, ultimately what we create, and again, I can send this to anybody. I'm not like, you guys can have all this, because you guys aren't. We can't be each other, you know what I mean? So you guys can have this all day. But throughout this process, we, we really create safety for the client and the family. And when we look at how important this is, and, and it leads right into the next point of rapid rapport. When a client and a family both feel safe, it's an incredible experience to be a part of. Because I don't know the last time a lot of these families felt safe, or felt like everything was going to be okay, or there was hope, or we know what we're doing right now. And what naturally happens throughout this, in working with these families, is that the first interaction we have with the client, there's automatically a feeling of containment, safety, and trust. Now, we always work with two people when we do these. Because the reason, the reason, and, and I'll, I, I, use, I use Jeff's quote, we always used to talk about that somebody's probably going to eat the shit sandwich in these types of interventions. Because if somebody's actively psychotic, delusional, the thinking is not right, they're usually going to target one person in there. And most of the time, it's not going to be a family member. So we have to really be able to work together as a team when we do this because somebody's going to get picked out immediately as bad object. And it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it goes smooth, but most of the time somebody's bad object. And there's the stares, and there's the delusion, and I don't like you, and especially when we're dealing with stuff of I'm famous, or I'm in a movie, or I'm in a TV show, you know, okay, you're the director. I know. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to be able to really work collaboratively with one another because as soon as one person is bad object, we have to be able to capitalize right away and gain that immediate trust and rapport with somebody. And we create a new affect in families because somebody mentioned earlier that people with schizophrenia are incredibly perceptive. So if I'm talking to somebody and they're already hearing five different voices, their thinking is extremely disorganized, delusional. How the heck am I going to sit in a room with this person and have them make a decision to get in a car, get on an airplane with me to treat them? And this is really the crux of what we do. Because this is how we have been able to get messages across without verbalizing them. And although we do use verb, although we do use different techniques, we have to be able to get a message through that this family is different. Things are changing. They're not going back to the way they were. And there's containment and safety in, in all of this. So it's this incredible thing to watch where we're, we're really raising anxiety. We're raising on the uncomfortable feeling, we're raising all these emotions, but yet we're also coming in from a different angle and providing this other level of support. So somebody who may not hear 95% of the words that we talk about throughout this process is going to be very perceptive. And the reason being is they're going to pick up on, really going to pick up on our body language. And we do a lot of work on how to train families to present a certain way in this intervention. And what we talk about is, if you're gonna tell your loved one that you're not gonna provide them with any more money, food, shelter, anything like that, but you're sitting there and you're shaking your leg, I guarantee he sees you shaking your leg and he knows that he's gonna show up. He'll, he'll leave and he's gonna show up 15 minutes later because he picked up on that you can't sit in a room with him uncomfortable for five minutes. So we really do a lot of body language technique with these families that we work with. Because again, body language itself is a form of communication. And we have to get a family who's been sitting around the table, because I guarantee they've had these conversations before, most have, but they sit around the table with their heads down, they shake, they're nervous, they play with their fingers, they play with their hands, and now all of a sudden we're, we, have to chain, we have to get them to do things differently and to get a message across that may not be heard, right? So you have a room full of people sitting, confident, eyes to them, deep breaths. You know, and this is, again, we do this over a period of days. 
that we work with these families on this, and we do rehearsing, and we do acting, and all kinds of things to get them to this place. But we really have to be able to get that through, the affect of somebody there. Again, I can pick up if you tell me something confidently, I know you mean it. I can also pick up if you don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> right? Even, even if you have the same look on your face, even if you have the same, there's, there's an affect piece of this. And a lot of families, to be honest, struggle a lot with the confidence around this. They are so afraid of what's going to happen. We really have to be able to get them to a place where they can sit in that room, uncomfortable, for maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Sometimes these things go on for a long time. Like I mentioned before, 13 hours on that picture. And that was in the moment intervention. So we really have to be able to train these families, body language, affect, nonverbal communication. You know, if somebody looks at me in the eyes, I know what they I know they mean business. If you're looking down and saying, I'm not gonna let you come back to the house, there's a lot of things there that tell me you're not very confident in the process that you're doing. So you really you could integrate all types of nonverbal commun communicative skills into a process like this. And again, I mean, I think that creating safety in the un uncomfortable and scary situation is really the most, is the most important here. Because we also don't want to exacerbate the symptoms that are currently going on. Like, we don't want to come in and create a higher, more dangerous level of psychosis. We do not want to do that. But at the same time, we have to be able to create this environment that is uncomfortable and scary, but yet comfortable and containing at the same time. And most of the time, we use families to do this. Because families are the ones who provide that strength. They provide the resilience. They provide exactly what that person needs. They just haven't been able to do it for however long it's been. And then presentation. Presentation is probably my favorite part of this, and this is really where the art of this type of intervention comes in. Do you guys think it's important where people sit? What order are they talk in? Where myself and my partner sit? Again, back into what we were talking about, the presentation of this and being able to pass a message along non-verbally to somebody who may not hear a lot of what we say. And what we do is we use a little bit of, obviously in this process, it's, it's really a combination of like Robert Meyer's craft model, some systemic work that Wayne does, Wayne Rader, and then a little bit of what Judith uses with the RISE. And they, and they were able to integrate all these behavioral techniques, really that were being effective in treating mental health on a daily basis. So when we look at presentation, like we'll actually use letters what do you guys think when I say that? Because it sounds really John Cena model, doesn't it? Yeah. Like this sounds real clinical. And like we're talking about Johnson model. What do you think the benefit of using letters <coughs> in this process would be? So that the family members don't forget important points <coughs> to communicate. Mm -hmm. it takes them a little more organized, a little more thorough, in depth. Right. It takes away some of the scary spontaneity or creates more uh, order. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, by the same token, it can sound very contrived to the can to to the subject. Maybe for a later date, maybe a later date, if you need to like keep in the treatment or something. Okay. Any other thoughts? I think it goes right to your your point about when you talk about creating safety in an uncomfortable situation on the family side. I think having that piece of paper in them can control some of their nonverbal communication. I think it can be really emotive. Um, and give them the freedom to express their true emotions because it's giving them that safety mm -hmm. and knowing that they're going to get all of their points across to that family member. So it's going to give them that safety to be really expressive and show their emotions and let go and be really authentic in the moment, but give them that safety in, in, in giving them the freedom to be able to do that. This is such an amazing tool for this type of intervention. And now I use letters doing substance abuse work if I need to, um, you know, whether I'm using more of a RISE model, Johnson, whatever it might be. Um, you know, I'll use letters a lot of times, and like Doug brought up, sometimes I don't use them in the intervention, but I'll send them to treatment. Mm -hmm. And I'll let, the, I'll let the therapist have them just so that if anything starts going on, they can say, that, well, this is how your family really feels. 
I think all the points you got, you guys brought up are spot on. I mean, I think besides what each of you brought up was that these families too many times have talked about this. Too many times they've had the conversation. Too many times they've had the, this, it can't go on like this anymore. So again, when we look at how are we presenting this message really through nonverbal communication, somebody's going to be able to sit there and say, this is different. This isn't how my family normally reacts to me. And whether this is conscious or unconscious, you guarantee that somebody picks up on the fact that their families are reading letters, and they're reading directly off a piece of paper, they're not going off of it, that that's, a di that's something different. My family's changing. So a lot of the goal here, again, is stemming from how we're, how we're presenting this message of things are changing in this family. And, and it's amazing how many families do not want to tell their loved ones that they're angry. And we encourage that. We say this is an opportunity for you to talk about how you feel. Whether or not they're going to hear it or really take that in, you need to talk about the way you feel. And you need to talk about how it makes you angry when you get threatened or pushed when you don't give, it, when you don't give your car keys up. Or anything like that. Do you find that the use of the letters also helps to like, strengthen the individual family members in that it's concretizing their thoughts and bringing it right to reality? Definitely. Yeah, because the way we usually structure our letters is we start off with, with good memories. Because there's always good memories in families, you know, and I think so many times the families have really forgotten mm -hmm. who this person is aside from the illness, aside from the behavior. So we have them start off with good memories. You know, and then we go into really direct behavior and how it affects you. We don't want to know about anything else. If you, if we're talking about drugs or a co-occurring case, don't even use the word drugs. We don't want it. We want behavior and how it affects you, because that's the type of stuff you can't argue. Somebody can sit in a room and say, when you came home drunk on Tuesday night and you punched your dad, that made me scared and angry. You know, you could argue if somebody said, well, when you use heroin. When you go out and smoke weed and get psychotic, well, I don't smoke weed. You know, you never see me smoke weed. Or that was one time. You can't argue behavior, so we really go into the behavior and how it emotionally affects you and how many times it's so difficult for a family to identify a feeling. And we have to sometimes break out a feelings chart <laughs> with five categories of feelings and, and direct feelings. How does this make you feel? There are feelings in between angry and sad. I promise you. You know, and having a family really have the opportunity, like you're talking about, to say, I'm angry. I'm scared. I'm worried. You know? So I think, yes. I mean, that, it's, it's a comforting piece for the family. It's a way that we make things look different to the, to the person we're intervening on. It makes the environment feel very, very uncomfortable, which is something we want to do. We don't want it to maintain the status quo where it's been at up to this point. We'll get to the video in a minute. Now, logistics on these types of interventions are extremely important. You know, when we, when we intervene on alcoholism, drug addiction, I call a detox. I say, hey, I've got a client, benzos and alcohol. Here's the insurance. Here's private pay. I'll get them up there later this evening. You guys coordinate transportation from detox to treatment. There you go. You guys think the logistics around treatment look a little bit more difficult? Someone suffering from schizophrenia? Yeah. They do. So, you know, we have relationships with behavioral units because most of the time somebody does need to be stabilized before they can come into treatment. The, the guy who came up here in December, he was, he was at Aurora Behavioral Health for like five weeks before he came to Sovereign. Um, and he hated me and he hated everyone else and you know what I mean and that's okay but ultimately he got to treatment and you know and that's a little bit of the difference as well with alcoholism and drug addiction compared to mental health you know I, I take a very different approach when it comes to mental health in terms of I will do anything in my power in that moment to be able to get someone into treatment and the help they need especially if they've displayed symptoms of being a danger to themselves or others if they've made active threats that I'll kill you if you come home. Mm -hmm. I will do anything in my power. I'm not afraid. You know, and, we, and, and we've been in interventions where people have tried to intimidate us. And we use this. Go ahead. Because I'm calling 911. I'm okay. Hit me. You know, and they don't. 
of course, because they no. don't want to get hospitalized. No one's ever hit you. No. They've come close. One that Jeff and I did, the guy was about to rip his throat off. <laughs> And it was it was gonna get it was about to get violent. He was manic and he was basically a manic drunk methamphetamine <coughs> addict who was huge. And he didn't like us being in his house, basically. <laughs> but no, nobody's ever acted violent. I've I've i someone's tried to hit me in treatment. Well, I've worked in treatment with mental health and with schizophrenia as well. Yeah, yeah. But not in the intervention setting. Because again, we bring a presence in there that although we're not an authority, we're not, we don't take the role of a police officer or anything like that, there's a sense of structure and that we're not going to be bullied around. And that's what we do with our body language as well. So when we talk about presentation as well, positioning ourselves in the family. A lot of times, say mom is the codependent enabler who cannot stop what she's been doing. We get her to say some things in that letter and myself and my partner are on each side of her. Now that portrays something to somebody that says, wow, my mom now has these two guys, I don't know. But things are changing in my family. She's saying things that aren't right. And what we do is we try to create that, that, that illusion of support. It's not an illusion, but that's what we want to do, is we want her, to, someone to be able to say, that looks, my mom looks really supported right now. She's separated from my dad, all these different things. So positioning, who reads? At what time? If we use letters, who reads when? It's extremely important, you know? Especially if there's weak members in the family and strong members in the family. We don't want everyone to go at once, or that we don't want someone to close on the end. Some of the, some of the best letters I've ever heard have been from, from siblings who are young. I think we had a 9 and a 13 year old girl who read letters that would make this whole room start crying right now. And that was the drunken Irish brawler intervention and they held the line for four and a half months telling him to leave soccer games they don't want to see him until he got help and he did so you know it's extremely powerful who reads when how we present the reading you know again what we talk about a lot of times in training these families it's, it's really natural tendency when you're uncomfortable to be able to look down and just read really really fast being able to slow down express your feelings in a confident way is extremely important. So the logistics, again, are just really difficult. A lot of times we have to work with clients who we get into the behavioral unit, and most people would say, great, he's in there. Now, most of the time we have to go and continue establishing rapport in a relationship with this individual. We really have to continue building that trust with somebody to be able to get them to willingly accept to go to long-term treatment. In California, unless you're on a conservatorship, which if you've worked with mental health, it can be extremely difficult to get especially when somebody can present really well. This one in December who came here was 19 years old with a full academic scholarship to Cal Berkeley 18 months prior. You don't think he could pull it together in front of a judge? <laughs> I mean, extremely intelligent individuals. Um, so logistics are just really hard. And then, you know, when and where. So do we do the intervention in a hotel room? At the house? In a park? In a way? Like, what would you guys think? Exits. Good exits. Good exits. <laughs> I like it. No, trust me, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I agree. <laughs> why, why do you think good exits is really important? Because if he wants to rip off your throat, you can get out of it. Because if they want to get, if they feel trapped, um, they may have a meltdown. There you go. Yep, and again, we use, back to the metaphors, we use talking about caged animals, right? Like, we never want to put someone in a corner away from the door. We always want to allow someone the opportunity to stand right up and walk right out with someone. Extremely important. And sometimes when we've had to go into a home and surprise somebody, it becomes a little difficult because we're trying to rearrange furniture and do this and do that. But again, you're right. You don't want to, both of you guys are right, you don't want to, cage somebody who might be psychotic and who may feel at some point threatened. Mm -hmm. And again, that's not, not, how, not how we go about it either. We want somebody to be able to stand up and walk out at any point. And again, we have tools and all types of things that we do when somebody walks out of an intervention. But it's just a good point on the when and where. You know, if somebody doesn't wake up till noon or 1230 every day, when should we do the intervention? Not yet. 
<laughs> I've had success with doing it like right on wake up time before. Yeah, I mean, I, and again, I mean, these are things that, that, you know, that we really assess in the moment. Like I couldn't stand here and say, if they wake up at 12, you should do it at 12. You know, because you just don't know. Everything changes with this. You know, in, in the one I'm going to give you an example of here in just a minute, it's, we had to go into the home. The guy was asleep. We had, a, we had a plane flight an hour and a half later. The, the family wasn't ready, and one thing we won't do is move if the family's not ready. We'll tell them, you've got to cancel the flight because we're not going to do this intervention unless you're fully prepared and ready to do this. The family took a long time to get ready that morning, and we had to do a full-scale intervention, get this guy out of bed, get him packed, and get him to San Diego Airport and on a plane to Florida within an hour and a half. Now, again, this was a little bit more of like going to war. I mean, this was real tactical work that we were doing at this time. But when I got to Florida, I get the guy through security on his own accord. We get to Florida, and I look at him, and he's been talking to himself the whole way, except when we're conversing. And he said, and I said, why did you agree to go? And he looked at me dead in the eye, and he said, Chris, because I knew my parents were going to hold to what they said. You know? So it's like, that's what we want. We want to be able to get a message through to somebody who is psychotic and be able to make a decision for themselves without trying to force them or re-traumatize what's already been going on up to this point, which is everyone shows up, they handcuff you, you're in the back of the car, and then you're in treatment, and then you're back out. We don't want to recreate that. We want to create this healing environment and using all these different kind of clinical tools and techniques to be able to do that. So what I want you guys, I want you guys to check this video out this last now the reason that the reason I put this video on is because we use I use the dog whisperer metaphor all the time with families, especially with mental health. And I ask them what who what happens when Caesar Milan shows up to the house, and they say, well, he goes and talks to the family, he does all this work with the family, and then the dog starts doing better things. <laughs> and so we always say like we're not trying to be ins insulting or anything by using that metaphor, but this is what we're looking for. We're looking to come in and work with you. And naturally, this animal who can't understand what you're saying, can't hear what you're saying, doesn't understand English, but you're able to get a message across without verbal communication, or at least language communication. You're using all nonverbal skills and tools and techniques, and that dog is acting different. And that's a lot of what we use. And I love this metaphor because, or this video, because it really shows what families go through with mental health and how we really try to get them to act even after getting there. So I mean, the dog at first tried to growl and snarl and get Caesar to walk away. What did he do? He said, non-verbally, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, and I'm not afraid. I'm okay to stand up to this, and I'm here to help. So even after he got bit, physically bit, he still stood his ground. And you could tell by his posture, by all of his nonverbal communications, by language, his tone of voice, that although I got bit, I'm not afraid. And I will be here, and I will do what I have to do to get you the help that you need. And so I, lo I love that clip. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> I'm okay with no questions. Impressive, Chris Bennett. In these cases, where do you usually uh, take uh, these subjects to for, and what types of programs, where do you take the schizophrenics to? Or anybody with. Uh, Primary mental health diagnoses and secondary chemical dependency. Where do you take them? It's such a tough decision to make. I mean, there's a really thorough clinical assessment that goes in long before we do an intervention. We collect all the collateral information from previous providers of treatment and really look at you know what's going on to, on to this point. I mean, obviously, Sovereign Health has been a referral source of mine. Um, Cooper Reese in Asheville, North Carolina, is a wonderful healing community. PCH. Uh, up in LA, yeah. um, 
obviously Mangers, Austin Briggs, I mean, there's a lot of places around the country, but it really depends on the individual and what they need as well. Yeah. Are any of those that you mentioned in network with insurance? Sovereign's doing well with insurance. No, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's why I work here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, primary mental health treatment is so difficult to get on a long-term basis. You can probably yeah. get 30 to 45 days somewhere on it, barely, you know, if you're lucky. Other than that, you're kind of you're looking at private pay. I know. And there's different yeah, options. I mean, changing options. options in San Diego is like five grand a month, and then which what, sorry, changing we, options. Changing options. Five yeah. grand a month. Yeah. Alma Chia is like 13 though. After all yeah. said and done, um, Cooper Reese, I love them as well because they. Give eight hundred thousand in scholarships every year, so they really help the mental health community. Thanks. Other than that, thank you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah.